Before we get started, I wanted to take the time to thank the sponsor of this video, Surfshark VPN. If you are someone who has trouble finding access to a lot of the classic samurai films I review here on the channel, it may be because you simply live in the wrong region, where your streaming platforms sadly do not offer a great variety. This is an issue that can be solved through having a VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network. Now, one of the key reasons you'd want a VPN is for privacy and security for how and when you access the internet. But beyond that, through Surfshark you can also change the country of which you are accessing the internet from. This allows you to work around region-blocked streaming services that have different shows and movies available in other countries. For that reason alone, I think signing up for Surfshark VPN is a fantastic idea. Especially given the fact that I so often get asked by people how can they watch a lot of the samurai films I cover on the channel, and a lot of times the issue comes down to streaming services not having access to different content in different countries. Don't let big streaming platforms dictate what you can and can't watch based on where you live. Get Surfshark today, and start watching more of the films and TV shows you enjoy. You can find a link to where you can sign up for Surfshark down below. Additionally, be sure to use promo code SHOGUNATE to get 83% off, and 3 extra months free. And hey, even if you are not completely satisfied with it, Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there really isn't any risk. But with that said, let's get on to the video. What was a daimyo? At face value, you might be saying to yourself right away, I know what a daimyo is. Samurai lords in feudal Japan, heads of powerful and ambitious clans, and yeah, that is exactly right. However, there is also a bit more to it than that, on top of the fact that there are a number of common misconceptions often associated with them as well. This is because the actual term itself has become overarching over the years, and has been made to fit and refer to a wider variety of leadership positions or roles in feudal Japanese society. And because of all this, I feel it is important to peel back the layers and discuss what really is a daimyo, and what makes one. So, here today we are going to be diving into just that. To start with, to understand the idea of ruling figures in Japan, we need to look at the roles of samurai leadership that existed during the Kamakura and Muromachi periods. Essentially, the times under the rule of first the Kamakura shogunate and later the Ashikaga. During these eras, the main position held by samurai military land governors was known as Shugo. And of course, Shugo answered up the chain of command to the Shogun, and down from them were various deputy and subordinate positions, such as Shugodai and Jito. However, it is believed that the term Daimyo may have first arose during the 11th or 12th century, as it was applied to prominent lords within the growing warrior class. The word Daimyo itself roughly translates to mean great name. It was a term that was meant to refer to lords who were of very significant status. And we can see that it contrasted with another term, shomyo, which on the flip side was a reference to figures who were of less significance and influence. After the rise of samurai rule in Japan, the term would carry on to be applied to the new powerful shugo military land governors. Thus we eventually start to see the use of the term shugo daimyo, essentially meaning a very significant samurai lord. Yet, it is believed that the idea of the Shugo Daimyo did not arise until the Muromachi period. That is not to say that there were not important powerful Shugo figures during the Kamakura period, but rather the weakening central government during the reign of the Ashikaga Shogunate provided the right conditions for lords to consolidate their power and gain that level of influence and prestige that the title Daimyo reflects. Although it is important to know that up until this point, the term daimyo was merely an expression. There was no official role or government position called daimyo. Rather, the word was just a term applied to those who held great significance. I'm going to summarize it again because it needs to be stressed. During the reigns of the Kamakura and importantly later the Ashikaga Shogunate, the official term for military land governor was shugo, not daimyo. The words were not interchangeable as the word daimyo was simply an expression that could be applied to powerful lords. Yet, that whole concept was set to change entirely as we finally move into the Sengoku Jidai, the age of the country at war, which erupted after the decade-long conflict known as the Onin War. 
which would completely go to shatter any and all Ashikaga authority and semblance of stability across the country. As we know, this weak Ashikaga authority had led to many clans becoming almost entirely autonomous by this point. But now, pair that with lords who were themselves ambitious and hungering for greater power and influence, and you find yourself in the making of what would become known as a Sengoku Daimyo. The first of the real Sengoku Daimyo are attributed to figures like Hojo Son, who usurped power for themselves through acts like Geko Kujo, the lower toppling the higher. You see, all of a sudden, lower lords who occupied vassal, deputy, and steward positions were now arising as independent forces. More famous examples of lesser families that arose into full daimyo status are the Oda, Mori, and Chosokabe. They were opportunists who seized advantage of the chaotic age of warring states and used the upheaval to not only assert their independence, but also embark on continued conquests to grow their domains. Obviously though, there were also many Shugo who retained their status and fell in line with the turmoil of the era, launching campaigns to subjugate neighboring provinces. Some fine examples of Shugo clans that transitioned into Daimyo clans were the Hosokawa, Takeda, and Shimazu. It was really here that the title Shugo started to fall almost entirely to the wayside. It had simply become unimportant. What really mattered now was how powerful your clan or family was, how mighty your regime stood. This is why the term daimyo, great name, was what had really become the most significant term for clan leaders. But that doesn't mean that the title of Shugo disappeared entirely. In fact, there are records that indicate that the Ashikaga shogunate well into the Sengoku period had even appointed some new daimyo into full shugo status. Regardless, by the time Oda Nobunaga dismantled the Ashikaga shogunate in 1573, the title was rendered meaningless, other than past prestige. However, the political landscape of Japan during the Sengoku period was a very complicated and often confusing one. And this of course is made more convoluted by the fact that the term daimyo had emerged as not just an expression anymore, but also now had sort of risen to become a defining title. Powerful lords were known as daimyo, and their strong clans were daimyo clans. Yet a common misconception that has arisen was that all lords across the country, no matter how prominent or minuscule, also bore the distinction of being known as daimyo, which appears to simply not be true. Remember, daimyo roughly means great name. This meant that to be considered a daimyo, a lord and his clan must exercise great power and hold significant territory. A lesser independent family would likely have not been recognized as such. A fine example of this odd limbo experienced by smaller landholding families is that of the Sanada. After the fall of the Takeda in 1582, who the Sanada were vassals to, they found themselves in an interesting position. Their lord, Sanada Masayuki, at first sought to survive the turmoil by swearing himself to a number of larger clans. This eventually would lead to the Sanada briefly becoming the new vassals of the Tokugawa. Yet after a disagreement between Masayuki and Tokugawa Ieyasu, who wanted the Sanada to relinquish control of one of their castles over to the Hojo, Masayuki rebelled to which he was then besieged by both the Tokugawa and Hojo. To everyone's surprise, Masayuki held firm and fought off the attackers, eventually allowing for the intervention of Hashiba, soon to be Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Masayuki's victory and new service under Hideyoshi propelled him into new status. He was no longer just a minor independent lord. Masayuki had officially become recognized as a daimyo. But this then begs the question, if Masayuki had become a daimyo, what was the role of someone above Masayuki, like Toyotomi Hideyoshi? Hideyoshi, just like his predecessor, Ora Nobunaga, had both at one point been simply considered daimyo. Yet as their power grew and they became leaders of massive regimes bent on unification, their positions had evolved. For Nobunaga, he had assumed the title of Daijo Daijin, which was the Chancellor of the Realm while Hideyoshi would in time assume the prominent title of Kampaku, the imperial regent. Thus, although they were still considered great names, they had sort of graduated past their daimyo role, 
and thus below them they themselves commanded a daimyo who were loyal to them, awarding new territory, and in many cases creating new daimyo. So then, with the title of daimyo becoming the go-to term for these clan heads, when did it finally become not just an expression, but finally an official position? Well, it appears to have been under the Toyotomi regime that through Hideyoshi's reorganization of Japanese society, the term daimyo at long last became sort of an official title, replacing the old Shugo title that had one point signified samurai military land governors. But really, the title would later be solidified into an official rank during the reign of the Tokugawa shogunate, into the Edo period, as the daimyo became powerful administrative figures who ruled over their allotted domains and were subservient to the new shogun. However, as a classification, the ability to be considered a daimyo was now largely based off of a family's status, official rank, the size of their stipend, their office, and prior service. But it is also here we additionally see the rise of two important terms attributed to the daimyo, fudai and tozama. These terms were not new, yet it was somewhat of a new concept to apply them to daimyo under the Tokugawa shogunate. Fudai daimyo were considered inner lords, trusted figures within the Tokugawa regime, while tozama daimyo were outsiders and were viewed with more suspicion. One of the primary catalysts for this classification can be attributed to the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, in which those who fought against the Tokugawa would all afterwards, for the most part, receive this new Tozama label. That is, if they were not totally wiped out or stripped of their lands. The title of Daimyo would continue on to be used until the Meiji Restoration, when a lot of the daimyo and other nobility transitioned over into a new Japanese aristocracy, known as the Kazoku. Kazoku was a term that roughly translated to mean exalted lineage. With this new recognition of their status, many of the important samurai and noble families of old continued to play a significant role in imperial Japanese politics until after Japanese defeat in World War II, followed by finally the new Japanese constitution of 1947, which at last abolished their role. The existence of the daimyo is a strange yet iconic one. Although often thought of as an official title, it actually played the role as more of a counter to the failing system of the Ashikaga shogunate. As great lords rose up to assert their dominance, they would reshape the face of Japan by ending the Sengoku Jidai, firmly establishing the title of daimyo as an official and hard-earned position within the new shogunate. Many, with significant samurai lineage, still live on to this day in Japan, including those whose families once bore the distinction of daimyo. Once again, I wanted to thank the sponsor of this video, Surfshark. Please check out the link below and use the promo code SHOGUNATE to get an amazing deal on your very own VPN. And with that said, Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.